Well, aloha, everyone. It's uh, Tuesday. Normally, we're here on Wednesdays, but uh, for some reason, uh, the Think Tech uh, Hawaii crew are doing some work uh, workshop uh, with OC16, I believe it is, on Wednesday. So here we are. Uh, we're very flexible. I found out about this about three hours ago. Hustle up my new my guest, uh, Richard Ha from the Big Island. So we're doing round two with Richard. Uh, the overall show is Hawaii, uh, the state of clean energy, and it's uh, sponsored by the Hawaii Energy uh, Policy Forum, and also some of the funding comes from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, uh, where I have my day job. So uh, without more ado or talking, I'm going to uh, introduce Richard Ha, who uh, was on the show uh, a couple of weeks ago now, and... We uh, also won the award for we were the fourth uh, most popular show at that, uh, that uh, previous week. So, yay. And that was all to do with Richard because he had such good content. So round two, uh, Richard, uh, last time we talked about the fact that uh, the shale oil, while it's been good uh, for a while, uh, it looks like it's, uh, uh, you know, there's storm, storm clouds on the horizon. That's the best way to put it. So, Richard, um, the first topic uh, you wanted to talk about and help us out with is some new developments and new information you have on the status of uh, shell oil. So I'm going to let you start doing some of the talking. Over. Oh, okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah, what, what uh, just took place uh, within the last uh, two weeks is that this guy, David Hughes, who's a well, very well-known uh, uh, researcher and um, expert in the field of, uh, of oil geology. Uh, wrote a book, and I ordered the book. I did, I, I've had it for a few days. Yeah. And, and what I was really interested in the book uh, was to see what his conclusion was about, and it was about shale oil. Right. And his conclusion was, you know, uh, ten years ago, when 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 I uh, uh, first noticed that uh, the shale oil was starting to come online pretty strong, and everybody was all excited about the finance shale, and nobody really knew what was going on. But prior to that, we were all afraid that if we didn't have anything coming online, we were in big trouble. That is, the U.S. would be in big trouble because right. we were then declining. But then the shale oil started, and the first one was the Barnett shale, and everybody got excited about it. And what we found out back then was that out of the 4,000 wells they, they uh, analyzed, the average well uh, gave off 90% of what it was going to give off in, in, in uh, four to five years. And so that told us, wow, in four to five years, we've got to drill a new one just to stay even. Now, that, was, that was scary. But nevertheless, that was in 2009. Then it went, it started uh, to increase in production. And then just recently, we're supposed to be the uh, uh, biggest oil producer in the, in the world. Um, so, but with this new book, what was really uh, important to notice was that that Barnett Shale I, 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 I talked about just, just, just now, yeah. back 10 years ago, was real popular. Right. Well, it's it's in permanent decline now. Well, that's that uh, that's pretty scary, isn't it? I mean, so we're we're going along with this false impression that everything's rosy and good, but the thing is, making it rosy and good is now uh, in decline. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. So so we knew it then, but then when we mentioned it to, to people, it was hard for people to understand because uh, there was so much oil, there was not a worry. But now we, we see that what we thought then is, is actually coming true. And so this book analyzes 10 of the, the, the shale plays that represents 90 something percent of all the shale oil in the, in the United States. And out of that, only four plays have a uh, you know, significant amount, maybe 50 percent of, of the total production. And the biggest one is called the Permian. And the Permian, what, what is scary about the Permian is that the, the, the CEO of Schlumberger, in his earnings uh, uh, report, said that 50% uh, of the wells drilled in the Permian is now child wells. Child wells, child wells mean that they've drilled all the sweet spots 
and now they're going in between those wells. Right. And 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 with current you know new uh, technology, they they manage to keep the amount of uh, production the same. But the difference is, instead of four to five years, what they succeeded in doing is getting more volume out, which means the thing is going to last a shorter period of time, like two to three years. Right. So now, 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 what do we do? Because what we do know, and with Nate Hagen's, you know, uh, uh, oil supply, world oil supply is tied to GDP, but and, and it makes sense because oil does work, yeah, and work is GDP. Right. So, so okay. So we're we're coming to the point where oil supply is going to drop off. I'd say three, four years, maybe even sooner. Okay. When it starts dropping off, GDP will start sliding too. Right. In other words, yeah. So, so here we are in Hawaii, in the middle of the Pacific, where everything is brought in. We are at the tail end of the supply chain. Right. So, what do we do? Well, that's yeah, the so question that, I was going to ask you. What's the What's the impact on Hawaii? Is it going to be like it was like uh, what is it, was it ten years ago when Price of oil went up so high. What what was it? One hundred and forty dollars a barrel, and uh, our energy costs uh, skyrocketed. And uh, you know it was really bad news for like at least a couple of years, two or three years before you know the oil uh, started to go back down. So yeah. so we're going to see another cycle like that. So I guess the question is, or the challenge is, is instead of just sitting back being complacent. We need to use this time that we have, this gift of time to get our, to be proactive and try to get ahead of this curve and be ready for it with our own indigenous supplies of energy and not fool around and wait and delay and all the other things that uh, happen so that we're not moving forward. So you want to sure. comment? Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, and there's another reason why, a practical reason why we should move forward quicker than slower. Okay. Because right now the oil supply is, is still up there. Right. So the price is, is still relatively uh, stable. Correct. Now, when, when we go down the uh, opposite side of the oil supply curve, the price is going to go up. Right. So if we wait too long, the infrastructure will cost more. True. So it's better for us to move now and, 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 and get it done faster rather than slower, just for that practical purpose. So how do we do that, Richard? I mean, in your opinion, what, what does it take? I mean, it obviously takes political will, but how can, we, how can we get that imparted to people? Because, you know, people only make moves. I mean, I read a book on it a long time ago. You know, they only make a movement when they're suffering some kind of pain. You know, if I'm not suffering pain, well, why bother? You know, but as soon as I start suffering pain, then I, then I want to, you know, address my pain and do something about it. And right now, I think the problem is nobody feels uh, threatened. There's no pain. I can go to the gas station. I, you know, I'm paying yeah. like uh, $4 a gallon or whatever it is. And that's not quite enough. That's not at the pain threshold. I mean, it hurts a little bit, but it's not at the pain level. So how do we do yeah. that? How do, how do we build a sense of urgency into our, our uh, public here, the general public, to get going on this stuff? Yeah, and, and what we should be doing is sharing the information in, in, in uh, Nate Hagen's uh, Reality 101 uh, uh, energy course, because so, he covers it really well. And we really need to be sharing this with the younger folks because it's their life that's being affected you so, know, so us, tell us about nate and what his uh, program is so for the people who aren't i mean most people don't know what you're talking about so here's a great oh, yeah. plug for you to make a pitch on what what nate's doing yeah well nate higgins used to be a um uh, he used to walk work on wall street okay and 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 he was an investment banker mm -hmm. And then, you know, and he, he only had multi-million dollar clients. Right. And, and what he did notice was that 
the, the, the folks that was his clients were motivated pretty much by just making more and more and more money. And then as he uh, observed the, and, and what was going on, he felt like, gee, something's wrong with this picture. Um, because they didn't seem to be uh, any happier making more money than the average person on the street. Um, so he quit his job. Okay. Then, then, then he started to, um, he quit his job and he became the, 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 um, uh, the director of, of the oil drum, this blog. Where, uh, it's where a blog, were, called, blog called the oil drum? Yeah, it, 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 it was back then, you know, okay. that was 10 years, even more ago, that people were having this discussion because, because we were noticing the oil, oil supply dec declining before shale oil. Right. So he quit, and then he spent all his time analyzing and trying to figure out what the picture was. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting about his approach is that it's a broad approach. It's, it's not uh, in silos. He's not an uh, oil engineer. He, he, he covers a lot of ground. He, you know, like he would know the, the reason why humans are motivated to do what they do. You right. know, so he's, he's produced a series of uh, videos. I've seen them, and they're, they're really geared uh, to uh, the general public. Uh, you know, the, they're non-scientific. Uh, they've got enough technology in them to, you know, to make the point. But they're really yeah. made for the general public and for the man in the street to really understand the situation. So I, as I understand it, you're planning on either bringing him out here or we're looking at actually doing a series on his uh his set of uh, videos is that correct yeah that is correct so uh, uh, um september and october he's going he's coming to hawaii okay. and we're try, trying to organize uh, uh uh i brought him to hawaii several years ago uh to give a presentation at uh Hilo. okay so this is going to be the second presentation like this but uh at the same time i've shown his video to to some of the people at the university and uh, community college uh, uh, and and they 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 realize immediately that that's this is something that they got to teach a young young folks so right. they're trying to figure out how to put it into their curriculum so Excellent. so that's what's going on uh uh in addition to him giving a talk and stuff but it's all about education and it's all about the young folks you know we gotta because they're they're smart they already know that something yeah. ain't right you know, so so then with this, this is w w what we're going to show them is that they're right. Something ain't right. So and, and give them an idea of what's taking place. We're not we're not in a position to tell them what exactly to do. But what we can do is, is tell them what uh, their uh, environment uh, uh, will look like as they're growing up and as time goes by. Right. And, and, and what to consider and, and, and so that they can make the decision. We, we need to empower them that way. So how do, we, you know, how do we reach the whole audience of everybody on Hawaii? What, do you have any ideas on how we do that? I mean, you know, you can have a little, uh, um, you know, um, like a presentations, but usually the crowds are small. How do you get to the whole uh, to the whole uh, population of Hawaii. What's, what, are, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, Think Tech Hawaii, you know, is one, you know, one avenue we can try to reach out, but, you know, we need to expand our, uh, our listening audience. So how do you think we do that? Do we, do we go and talk to the Board of Education and, and, or the legislature and say, hey, how about mandating, make it a policy that the DOE has got to mandate the, this kind of uh, courses in, in our, stu in our uh, schools? Uh, yeah, I, I do think that's a, that's what we need to do. We need to educate all, you know. And the question only is, how young uh, uh, should should we uh, expose them to this this uh, idea of what's going on? Well, you know, and, you uh, said you said it. These kids are smart. You know, I mean, you know, if, yeah, you, if you challenge them, I mean, these little kids, like four or five year olds, you know, they know how to work computers and do all this kind of stuff. Uh, they read and write and all this kind of things. I I would think. You know, we could gear it for, you know, different grade levels and uh, yeah. start them out really young. I mean, I was over at the uh, Marine Corps Base Elementary School and uh, gave a presentation on hydrogen to these kids. And I was like blown away by how 
informed these kids were and the questions they asked were like really really mature and they've been yeah. thinking about this stuff it, i mean frankly to use it i was blown away by how how uh informed these kids and kudos to their teachers too because the teachers yeah. were promoting that and they mm -hmm. in fact invited us to come over there and give the presentation in the first place so i mean some teachers local teachers took the initiative showed great initiative but we need to get this out to all the schools um, yeah, absolutely. private yes. schools, uh, public schools, all the schools, because that's where you can capture the kids. And they're, they're there. They have to be there. And these yeah. courses and these videos were really entertaining. So it's not like, oh, my God, I'm going to fall asleep or this is really boring. So, uh, right. so anyway, right. uh, we're going yeah, yeah, to stop and have a break right now. Um, so uh, we'll be back in about one minute, and we're going to – Continue this conversation, Richard. So you can start thinking about the answer of how do we get the word out and keep it out there and make sure people have really got it, you know? Right, so. right, right, right. Okay, so we'll be back in about one minute. So stand by. Aloha, I'm Stan Osterman, a host here on Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness here on the island. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Mahalo. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Gwen Harris, the host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of the supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Well, hello, everybody. We're back from our one-minute break, and we're live. And uh, I have with me uh, today, uh, by the uh, magic of science and beaming in microwaves on the Big Island, I have Richard Ha, who is uh, making a second appearance within the month. And um, we're talking about something close and dear to everybody's heart, which is energy, and how can we be proactive, and how can we make sure we don't get hammered uh, when we eventually uh, run out of fossil fuels or they become so expensive that we can't really afford them. So, Richard, uh, we're back, and uh, I asked you the question uh, before the break, which was, how do we get the word out, and, and especially to the kids and to our whole population, as opposed to having a conference, which is, a, even if it's attended by a couple of hundred people, it doesn't get the word out. We have you know, millions, uh, a million and a half people that have to get the word on this. So, your thoughts? Well, I think what I need to do, or we, we need to do, <clears throat> is talk to um, Mrs. Ige, the governor's wife, and show her the vi videos. Oh, okay. And then she could give us advice on how we, what she thinks, first of all, and I'm sure she's going to agree with everybody else. Um, and then she can make suggestions as to how we should do this, because she's an educator. Oh, you know? okay. So I think that's an important thing. And, and anybody who's listening in who can think of and give us suggestions, you know, we're, we're more than willing to do whatever we got to do, because this is probably the most important thing uh, that I've ever seen in my whole life. As a matter of fact, when I went to the uh, ASPO conferences, Yes. What I learned became my kuleana. I was just minding my own business, being a banana farmer. Right. And then I got this information. I went, holy smokes. I'm the only one from here, here from Hawaii. And so I happened to be, I happened to have this knowledge. It's not that I want it or anything. I'm stuck with it. You know, so, so much so that I was CEO of a medical cannabis operation. I, Some people would think that's the job of a lifetime. Yeah. You know what? I quit because I said, you know, you guys are on your way. Uh, good luck. 
But I only signed up for a short period to make sure you guys were good. Then I got to go back to what I'm doing. And what I'm doing is right, exactly what I'm doing now is advocating for education. And there are many other things that we can do. And I can give you some, for instances. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go through some, some stuff fast. Okay. Uh, one is, when I, what, before I went to the Peacock Conference, as a matter of fact, I was a supporter of the 30-meter telescope yes. for two reasons. One was education, and the other thing was economic development, because there's a whole bunch of jobs and, and, and stuff yeah, associated with it. Sure. So that's sure. still the case. <laughs> now, we are talking about a culture center above the clouds and a culture center for this reason. You know, there's a problem up in Mauna Kea. There's too many people up on the mountain. There's too many sensitive places where people are going. Yeah. And the 20-acre uh, site at the uh, Halepohaku is too small to do two services. Right. The, one, the, what, the, the primary function is to provide support service to the uh, telescopes up there. Right. And, and their second uh, uh, mission, and this is kind of an afterthought, is, is to talk about culture. But, but the problem is, 20 acres is too small to do both things. Right. So what we propose is, is having a culture center above the clouds at, at that level, but to the west. And the reason for it is because most of the traffic going up there is, is for stargazing. I mean, there are hundreds of people that go up to, to, to look at the stars through telescopes and stuff like that. Right. And, and to the west, about a quarter of a mile in, there's plenty of room out there. And if you did it over there, you wouldn't be uh, risking the people's uh, safety the way it is right now, uh, right on the side of the road. And, and people are parking off, you know, on, on four-wheel drive roads. There's just so many people up there. Right. Um, so the culture center about the clouds it can be a place where, where we, um, what I should say is, if we don't do something that respects the Hawaiian culture, the Hawaiian culture will be forgotten. Mm -hmm. And the reason for it is because it's a, just a small population, Hawaiians are. And, and basically, we're an endangered species. You know, I, I'm quite a Hawaiian, but if you put me in a lineup, nobody would even guess that I have any Hawaiian. As right. long as my grandma was pure Hawaiian. Really? So it doesn't, yeah. we don't have that much time, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you wouldn't think it. Yeah, I that wouldn't I, have thought at all. No. <laughs> That's what I say. Yeah, yeah and, and all the Hawaiians are in the same situation. So what could we do to make sure people don't forget us? You know, like, like what they did in Machu Picchu. 500 years ago, they were Incas. Uh, if not for Machu Picchu, we wouldn't know who the Incas were. Right. Now, if, if you wanted to find out, you got to go get a DNA test. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's the same thing. But, but, but taking a step back and, and trying to think about the situation we're in with energy and Hawaiian values, then, then you know, you, when you start to think about that, uh, the, the, the regular folks, the Hawaiians, they were all about aloha and sustainability. Right. And that is the whole thing that will give you uh, 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 the roadmap to deal with this energy shortage. It's not about money. It's not about uh, who get the biggest house. What it is really about is sustainability and aloha each other. We cannot be fighting with each other. They're not going to help anything. Right. You know, so, so, but, so but that's... You know, but, but, you know, um, Richard, every time we try to do something, like, just look at the geothermal, for example, you get these crowds of anti-geothermal activists coming out. So, I mean, they stop everything in their, in, in, in their tracks. And look how long it's taken them to, to get the 30-meter telescope approved. I'm not even sure. Has it even been a, finally approved yet, or is it, are we still fighting yeah. a battle there? No, they went through the process. They went through the Supreme Court. So yeah. they, they're just going through the, 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 the things they need to do to go to work, yeah? But so why, why, can't, why do we have to go through all these fights? Why, why, you know, it seems like we're always fighting amongst each other. There's the people that want to do the cans, and then there's the no cans. Yeah, I, and I think it has a lot to do with the, the, the native culture. Yeah. Before, before uh, um, uh, 
uh, Captain Cook came here. Yeah. We had a gift, gift economy. Uh, a gift economy is the more you gave, the more you receive. You never expected uh, exact change, you right. know. Okay. It, it was, it, <laughs> but then we, we were exposed to the market economy. The market economy, you got to get exact change. And then the more, more you get, the more you receive. It's kind of a conflict between the gift economy and the market economy. And that still has, you know, uh, repercussions. Right. But uh, what, what I think we can do is, is to, you know, to use Mauna Kea, not, not uh, uh, to make sure, and the culture center is, 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 is why, why would we want to have a culture center out there? So, so that we can say that the moral authority of what takes place on Mauna Kea is aloha and sustainability. That's Hawaiian values. Right. The reason for being up on Mauna Kea is not astronomy. Astronomy is secondary. Mm -hmm. Primary is Hawaiian values. Yeah, and then Hawaiian values just happen to be a way you can market uh, um, uh, Hawaii so that you can get more jobs because, you know, this oil thing is all about jobs, raising your family and stuff like that. Sure. So, so, so now what, what we can do is market around uh, Hawaiian values and, and of aloha and sustainability and kind of move off of sun and surf because you can do sun and surf all over the world. Yeah, and true. Cheaper, right? So we're coming up to one minute to go. So uh, we're going to have to start winding up. So if you can you know, continue on with the thought, but uh, understand that uh, we, we have a limited amount of time left. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so let me, let me mention that we're, we just formed a Native Hawaiian chamber. And the reason okay. for it is we would like to have, a, what would make this Hawaiian chamber different than all the other chambers? Right. Well, we're, we, what we would like to do is to have uh, uh, perpetuate Hawaiian values and, mm -hmm. and a place to have a discussion where everybody in the community can come and, and, and give the input. And then we can start to figure out how we all move forward together. Is it restricted the, to uh, Native Hawaiians only or can people no, like myself no, no, attend? No. No, no. It, it, anybody can join. I, I would say the requirement is that you have your uh, have the Hawaiian values at heart. Right. Yeah. So it, it's not uh, uh, assigned to any particular race. Yeah. Okay. It's, but uh, but the values. Yeah. Yeah, values are uh, really important. And uh, on that note, uh, Richard, uh, we've got to uh, sign off uh, pretty soon. I got like nine seconds to go. So I really want to thank you for uh, uh, being on the show again. We're going to do this again because this is really good information that you're uh, passing on to all of us and it needs to get out and you need to have a place where you can, you know, project out to everybody. So thank you very much for being on the show. And yeah. to all our audience out there, thank you very much for uh, listening in. And this is uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Ewan, and we will see you next week. So aloha.